I remembered this time. Um, right, so uh, last time we were talking about the normal force uh, in the context of static equilibrium, the question being, um, we know where the gravitational force is applied. The gravitational force is applied effectively at the center of mass. Um, the question then is, where must the normal force be applied so that the object doesn't just randomly start rotating, right? If I just put an object, say my pen on my hand, it doesn't just start rotating on its own. And that's because there's no net torque on it. And that tells us something about where the normal force could be. In particular, when the only other force acting on the body is, the, uh, is, gravi is gravity, the normal force has to act directly below the gravitational uh, directly below the gravitational force in a straight line downwards to the point of contact. Otherwise, there would be a net torque about the center of mass, and so the object would start rotating. So um, the next question is, what if gravity isn't the only force? So if I push, push down on the object, say with my thumb, um, then you might ask, where is the normal force? So the picture here is you have your lumpy thing sitting at rest in static equilibrium. You have center of mass pointing downwards, or uh, gravity pointing downwards. And then maybe I apply a force like, uh, say, here. So. If it, if it were the case that the normal force stayed underneath the center of mass, then what would happen is this normal this force here would apply a torque. And, and a way to see that is that the moment arm, which is that which is that distance there, is non-zero. The force is non-zero, and so the net torque would be zero because the the gravitational uh, or gravitational force and the normal force, neither of which or neither the gravitational nor, 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 nor normal force would do or would contribute to the torque. So it cannot be there, because if it were, the object would just start spinning. And we're assuming that even though you're pushing down on the thing, it doesn't just start moving. It just stays still. So instead, the normal force, the normal force must move somewhere. It has to move somewhere between the between the center of mass or between how about let's say between the gravitational force and the applied force uh, and obviously when i say between them i mean in the horizontal direction Uh, is the vector mg starting at the pivot? No, the, it's starting at the center of mass. mg always is always applied from the center of mass. There is not, not any pivot necessarily here. So the point is, is let's take this picture above, uh, copy it and paste it down here. So the correct picture as to where this, uh, this normal force acts, come on, let me drag it. There we go. The normal force has to act somewhere like maybe here, somewhere between the two. And the reason for that is because yes, while the, nor while the, uh, the normal force will now produce a torque, that torque will precisely cancel out the torque produced by this uh, applied force. So the normal force, just as we saw before, how the normal force is a balancing force, it just apply it applies as much force as needed in order to make the, the net force zero in the vertical direction. It's also a balancing force in the sense that it moves to whatever location is needed in order to have the net torque be zero. Because the ground is going to stop the object from rotating. And so if it were going to rotate, let's say that you have your ground, right? You're pushing down. If it were going to, if the object is going to rotate this way, the ground's going to push up on this side harder. And so that can be accounted for in the fact that the net that the uh, the normal force is greater on the right hand side rather than on the left hand side. So it, so the uh, effective normal force can be seen as being further to the right. Um, this would be the time that I would normally show a class uh, 
nice demo with a, a wine bottle and some uh, nifty things, but unfortunately, uh, I can't really show you because I don't have a wine bottle because I'm not a wine drinker uh, and I don't have a fancy wine stand either. Um, but just know that the normal for that normal force can always apply at any point of contact. So as long as uh, no, it won't work with Arizona. And I also need a particular uh, uh, prop. Um, as long as there is a uh, a point of contact, the normal force could be there. So the normal force will shift around depending on what forces are applied. But as long as it's allowed to, as long as it's will shift around to places that are. Um, that are in contact with, with the surface that the object's on, that's, that's an okay place for the normal force to be. And that, le that leads us um, nicely into this idea of uh, stable and unstable equilibrium. So let's talk about conditions for tipping. Not like tipping at a restaurant, but tipping over. And stable and unstable equilibria. The plural of equilibrium. So let's slightly change the scenario. Let's instead, instead of considering the above picture, let's instead consider this thing. Uh, let's, so I tried to reproduce that thing above sideways. And it's just balancing on its tip. So we know that the normal force can only be applied at one location. And that's because there's only one place where the uh, where the ground is in contact with the uh, with the surface, or sorry, when the object is in contact with the surface. So that's where the normal force is. Our uh, mg, you know, maybe it's here, but in particular, they're you know they're not lined up. And hopefully, your intuition would tell you that you would need to push on your object uh, with some force in order to get it to stay in equilibrium. because otherwise it'll just fall over. Because the normal force can't move around to compensate for the other forces in the problem. So, so what happens if I decrease the magnitude of F? Well, I mean, I would imagine that your intuition probably agrees with reality. The object will fall. It'll, it'll flip over, and it'll start to rotate. Um, because there is a net torque about this, this point of contact, right? The normal force doesn't apply any, any torque, but the gravitational force will, because it is not parallel to the, uh, to, it, it is not, how do I want to phrase this? Um, the normal force does not Sorry, the gravitational force is not in line or parallel with the displacement or the, the moment vector. So the moment vector would be something like this. And because they're not parallel, there will be a torque and it'll cause rotation. Um, <clears throat> so in, in the normal case, if you decreased, or in, in, the, in the other case, if we decrease the magnitude of this force F, that would just mean that the normal force would shift to the left to compensate for the decreased torque applied by F. So the normal force would apply less torque. Um, but in, in this case, where we just have a single point of contact, if we decrease the magnitude of F, the normal force can't shift to compensate. So instead, what happens is the, the object uh, is no longer in static equilibrium. Um, i.e. it starts to fall. So what's the conclusion then? So like, what, what do we learn from this, from this thought experiment? Well, for any object, if the, only forces, if the only acting forces are gravity and the normal force, then the object falls over if the normal force cannot be under the gravitational force. For example, uh, if if the, if the force in this, if the applied force F here in this diagram was zero, the object will fall over. And that's because the normal force cannot be underneath the gravitational force, directly underneath it. Um, on the other hand, if the, uh, if the normal force can move to be underneath the gravitational force, 
then uh, we would get, uh, then the object would not tip over. So for example, if, if this object was instead shaped like this, then the normal force could shift to be underneath it and it wouldn't fall over. But alas, that's not the case. So the object tips. So, so that's, the, that's the condition for tipping. The condition for tipping is that um, the object will tip if the normal force cannot move underneath the gravitational force. Uh, and of course, that's only true when the gravitational force is the only acting force besides the normal force. But that's what, like, that's what we're talking about when we're saying tipping. For example, um, brief demo. Uh, let me angle this down further so it's more horizontal. Right. So theoretically, if my hand was perfectly stable, I could balance this on my hand. I could. It wouldn't be stable, and we'll get to stability in a minute. But if I tilt it, the center of mass is somewhere in the middle of the pen here. And so, but the normal force can only be applied at the location where the pen touches my hand. So the normal force cannot move to be underneath the pen, and so it just falls. It, it, it is no longer in static equilibrium. Whereas by applying a force, uh, which is what I'm doing with my fingers, I'm able to keep it in static equilibrium. But if I weaken the force by letting up a little bit, it'll fall, um, or at least it'll, it'll change position until it gets to a new static equilibrium, which is what happens when I uh, push it and pull it and so on. Uh, it's moving to a new static equilibrium. So the condition then is that th the base, whatever is touching the ground, must be below the center of mass in order to prevent tipping. Now, obviously, this is only true when gravity is the only acting force. Well, gravity and the normal force. OK, so what about stability? How do we know if, a, if an equilibrium, a static equilibrium condition is stable? Well. You, again, your, your intuition is probably pretty good here. Um, we define the stability, the stability of an object or a configuration by the angle through which through which we can rotate it. such that it returns to its original position, if let go. Returns to its original position, if let go. And I'll draw a picture here in a minute. So, uh, let's, it, so an example would be you have a stable configuration would be something like this. You have a pyramid or something, you have your MG, with a force pointing downwards, and you have you know, a normal force pointing upwards. That's stable. And the reason that's stable is because if I tilted the, if I tilted the pyramid, say 10 degrees that way, it'll fall back down into its original configuration. An unstable configuration, though, would be something like this. The same object just flipped. So you still have gravity pointing straight down. And you just have one point of contact for your normal force. Um, in this case, in the case on the left, if we tilted it, uh, let's tilt it to the right, uh, just so that I'm, my drawing is consistent. If we tilted it to the right, we only have one point of contact, and our normal force still points down. But look at the direction that the torque applied by that, uh, by that normal forces. Well, it can, suppose we're considering, oh, can I scroll up? Scroll down a bit, please. Wait a minute. Who needs to scroll up? All right, scroll up here. Is here okay? All right. All 
I'll give it a minute or so. Yeah, sorry about that. I didn't see the messages earlier. That is true, though. You can go back to the recording. So, but you know, I don't want to go too fast. So maybe I should just slow down. Am I clear to proceed to here? Why was it auto scrolling? Stop. Okay. All right. I will proceed. Um, yeah, so that's the point, Niraj. Uh, if I tilt the screen far, if I tilt the, the first triangle far enough, it will not go back to its original position. And so the stability of that triangle would be, say, negative 45 degrees to 45 degrees. That would tell you the range of angles that you could tilt it over which it would return back to its original position. Beyond that, it wouldn't. But the fact that it has a non-zero stability range means that we call it stable. Um, now imagine that we tilt this, oh, oh no. Imagine that we tilt the, uh, the triangle to the right. Now let's compute, say, the torque about the center of mass just for, uh, or actually let's compute the torque about this pivot point here. At least imagine it. Well, if that's the pivot point, the normal force won't do any torque because the, uh, the moment arm has length zero. But the gravitational force has a moment vector that looks something like this between those two points. And so you could figure out what direction the, uh, the torque that the gravitational force applies, and it applies a torque counterclockwise. And so the object will tend to rotate back to its original position. Now you'll, you'll, you'll see that if we tilted the uh, if we tilted the um, the configuration until the point where the center of mass is directly above the corner that is touching the uh, the surface, that is our limiting point because at that point it becomes configured like this, like the, like the leftmost triangle, and it'll either fall to the left or fall to the right. And so if it falls to the left, then it returns to its original position, in which case we call it stable. If it falls to the right then it's, that's no longer in its stable regime. And that's precisely at the angle, which I suppose would be what, uh, would it be for an equilateral triangle, it would be what, uh, 30 degrees? No, it would be 60 degrees. Yeah, so it has a stability of 60, uh, plus or minus 60, 60 degrees, uh, counterclockwise. However, let's look at tilting this one slightly to the right. So if we tilt that one slightly to the right, it's a terrible triangle. Uh, nope, I can do better. Still do better. It's very hard to, write, to draw a tilted equilateral triangle. Let's say something like that. Then the center of mass is now here, and our normal force can't change locations. So now the, uh, the torque that the, that the um, gravitational force, uh, it's not really related to energy diagrams in terms of stable and unstable equilibria. I, well, OK, actually, let me rephrase. Yes, it's very much related to energy diagrams in terms of stable and unstable equilibria. Um, I was thinking of, of free body diagrams. But yes, yes, it is very much related to it. Um, So, so the torque here would be clockwise. And so it will not fall, but not go back to its original position. It'll in fact just fall down. So it just continues the rotation rather than going back to its original place. Right, so that, that, that's all I wanted to say about stability. It's just the, the way we quantify the stability of a system is we ask how much can you, or the, the rotational stability anyway, you ask how much, how much of an angle can I rotate this object before it can't return back to its original configuration. And that's a, it's, a, it's something that you can measure or calculate. It's not, not so hard. But I just wanted to make sure that that's uh, straightforward enough. We're going to slightly change gears here. We're going to work towards something a little bit more practical. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to give you some steps for problem solving statics. These are statics, statics like problems. Now, not all problems will involve the object being in static equilibrium. Sometimes the object will be accelerating or something like that. But you can use the same techniques 
for all of these types of problems that involve torque and force. So step one, isolate the object in static equilibrium or the object that's moving. Um, I'm going to be writing these as if we were just solving statics problems. Isolate the object in static equilibrium, I'm going to abbreviate it SE, in a force diagram. So that means draw a force diagram for just the object that's in static equilibrium. Um, by the way, this isn't always easy. Um, sometimes there are multiple objects that are all interacting with each other, but usually it becomes obvious if your choice of system is wrong, i.e. if you forgot to include something in your system, then uh, uh, you'll find that there's no possible way for it to be in static equilibrium because you forgot, you neglected something. Um, I'm going to put an S here. It could be more than one object. Step two, define a coordinate system. Uh, this is an X, Y coordinate system. This is like when we did regular free body diagrams, you just draw in the corner of your, uh, of your diagram, you draw you know, x and y, or maybe you draw x and y, something like that. Um, this is for the force components. And also, in addition to what we did before, when doing tipping problems, we have to find a point of rotation. Yeah, but if an object is rotating, it's rotating about any point. So I could have chosen the center of mass for the rotation, and that would have been equally valid. Um, so we've defined a coordinate system for the force components, and we have to choose, choose a direction, which is either clockwise or counterclockwise, for a positive value of torque. So the picture here, and this is what I would typically do, I would draw this little diagram in the top right hand of my force free body diagram. So this indicates that to the right is positive in the x direction, to up is positive in the y direction, and, and a clockwise torque is a torque that's positive, hence a, a counterclockwise torque would be a torque that's negative. That's the kind of diagram I'll do. And I'll do an example about, of these in a minute. I just want to lay out all of the steps. Step three, extend each force vector uh with a dotted line this is that business of the uh finding the moment arm and again i'll be more explicit about this in a minute with a dotted line um as far as it goes on the page in both directions now this is um not quite necessarily true right like you don't often need to extend it across the entire page once you get the feel of it, you can just extend it however far you need it. But the point is, is you want you want your extended force vectors um, to uh, be long enough to do the to do the appropriate calculation. Step four: choose a pivot point. It doesn't matter which. Um, and stick with it for the remainder of the problem. That means that you have to calculate all torques about that pivot point and all the angular accelerations that you end up calculating or that you might end up calculating are relative to that pivot point. Um, just a quick note here, um, not all statics problems have uh, in, involve hinges, like some sort of hinge or a natural pivot. Um, that's not what I mean when I say pick a pivot point. What I mean is, is just choose a point that's convenient for calculating torques, a point in space. It doesn't have to be at an actual hinge or at a natural pivot. Like I did not have to choose this point as my pivot point. I could have chosen over here as my pivot point and it would have worked equally well. All right. There's several steps, so you know we got to keep going. Step five: use geometry to determine uh, to determine the perpendicular distance. The perpendicular 
distance from every point, or sorry, from every force, every force line. Those are those extended force lines that we did in part three to the pivot point. Sorry, I did not mean for it to scroll down. It kind of just did it automatically. Um, these distances that we determine, these distances are the moment arms. They are called the moment arms of the forces. So each force has its corresponding moment arm. All right, step six. Multiply the moment arm. So that was just to get a number that we need. Multiply the moment arm by the magnitude of the force to obtain the magnitude of the torque. And I'm going to do an example of all of these step by step in, a, in an example problem. So all, all, is, all of this step is saying is it's saying the magnitude of the torque is equal to the moment arm, which is what this r perpendicular magnitude is, times the magnitude of the force. That's what this step is saying. It's saying compute the magnitude of the torque that way. Step seven, stop automatically scrolling. Determine whether each torque is, whether each torque is clockwise or counterclockwise. and give each torque its corresponding sign. So six and seven are kind of mashed together because you could just, instead of saying the magnitude of the torque is blah, 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 you could just say the torque is plus blah, 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 or minus blah, blah, blah. So you can kind of mash six and seven together. Um, and give each torque its corresponding sign. And so what you do is you refer to the coordinate system that you chose, which includes a direction for torque, and you determine if it's positive or if it's if it's if the torque is in the direction of the uh, of the positive rotation that you refer to, you get it, you give it a positive uh, a positive direction. Can one force have components that cause both clockwise and no, no, it cannot. Well, okay, yes, a force can have components that cause both clockwise and counterclockwise torque, but a single force will never will either do clockwise or counterclockwise. But you can always break up a force into components and but yeah, that's yeah. Give each torque its corresponding sign. Step eight. Add up all the torques. All the torques. Uh, X component forces. And Y component forces. and set each sum to zero. So what we're doing here in this step is we are assuming the object is in static equilibrium. If the object is in static equilibrium, that means that the net force in the x direction, in the y direction, and the net torque are all zero. Otherwise, it would either be moving in the x, y, in, in, the, in the x or y directions, or it would be rotating. Um, Your solution to the problem, whatever you're solving for, um, will usually be obtained by solving this system of equations. Um, if, if, if not, if your solution is not there, if not, uh, go back to problem four or back to step four. Um, and repeat with a different pivot point. Confused, have we learned that we can, I'm kind of confused. Have we learned that we can multiply moment by force to get torque magnitude? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, this here, this moment arm, is by definition this. That's, that's how it's defined. And I did define that uh, on Wednesday. 
Right. So, so the point of the point of step nine is sometimes you get very unlucky and you choose a bad pivot point that kind of just ignores the value that you're trying to solve for. It just doesn't show up in your equations. And when that happens, you just get unlucky and you just have to go back and try again with a different pivot point. Now, with experience, it's not a guessing game anymore. You can kind of figure out which would be a good pivot point to use. But, um, but in general, uh, you might have to do that. So just as a quick aside, um, sometimes if you choose a very good pivot point, you can get away with not worrying about the force sums, i.e. The, the net force, uh, or all, of the, all of the things you're interested in would show up just in your torque equation alone. Your torque equation only has one variable in it, for example. So I'm going to show you. Um, I'm going to show you two. Uh, I'm going to show you an example of solving it in two different ways with two different pivot points, and I'll show you why one's a good a good choice and one's a bad choice. So the example that we're going to talk about is we have a guy on a ladder. Let me make sure that this is actually. Uh, I hate that it auto scrolls sometimes because my hand is touching the screen. This ladder forms a 60 degree angle, and we have our person standing three quarters of the way up the uh, up the ladder. So the guy is 75% of the way up the ladder. Not a race. Up the ladder, um, and uh, the the person weighs. 700 newtons. The ladder weighs, because uh, the ladder has a mass too, weighs 150 newtons. And by the way, remember that the weight of a thing is a force, not a mass. If you wanted to find, so, so when I say it weighs 700 newtons, 700 newtons is like 160 pounds. Like that's, that's not a whole lot. Um, you know, it's 70 kilograms. On Earth, anyway, um, the wall is frictionless. Um, but the floor is not. So, assuming static equilibrium, I have an abbreviation for this. Compute the friction force from the floor. So let's first uh, let's first just think about this. Um, is it surprising that this that this can happen? Of course. I mean, like you can put a ladder up on you know glass, and glass is very low friction, for example. Or you could put up a ladder on something very very thin. Um, the ladder. Thank you. Yeah, I kind of dropped that word. The ladder weighs seven hundred newtons or uh, one hundred fifty newtons. So the idea here is that the uh, the the friction force is going to um, provide, the friction force will have to provide some sort of, uh, or there, rather there will have to be a friction force in order to prevent rotation. So we're going to do that. Um, right, uh, so let's first try it with a bad pivot, a bad pivot choice. All right, so step one. Um, let me pull out the steps so that I can follow along to make sure so then you guys can see exactly how it's done. So the object in static equilibrium here is the ladder. The ladder is not rotating. So I'm going to um, draw a force diagram for it. It's an extended force diagram, by the way. I'll just draw it as a line because it doesn't matter how thick it is. Um, so here's our ladder. Um, and I need to draw. Let me just thicken it up so it doesn't get confused with other things. It's terrible, but it'll do. No, you know what? That's a terrible idea. I should just leave it. Leave it as is. OK, there's our ladder. Sue me. OK, so we need to apply. We need to draw in all of our forces because this is a force diagram. So we have a normal force coming up from the ground, right? We have uh, 
a center of mass gravitational effect from the ladder, let's call that the weight of the ladder, we have the person's weight is applied downwards. Really, it's actually a contact force from the person's gravitational force, but it's enough to just call it, it we know how that works out. So we can just call us the weight of the guy. Now, the, the object is also touching, the ladder is also touching the wall. So there could be a horizontal contact force from the wall. Now that we know that there's no friction force from the wall, but there is a horizontal, a horizontal pushing force. The, the ladder is pushing against the wall. Um, and further, we know that there is going to be uh, some sort of friction force. Uh, and we know, we can almost kind of guess what direction it is because if this is the only horizontal force, we know that the friction force will have to be this way to cancel it out. So we'll call this, this force here at the base of the ladder, F. This angle here is 60 degrees because we're going to need that. And so, <clears throat> okay, so far so good. We've isolated the object in static equilibrium in a force diagram. Um, next step is to find a coordinate system. So I'm just going to choose a standard coordinate system. I'm going to choose this is x, this is y, and I'm going to choose this is positive, clockwise is positive. Next step, oh, I should move this because it's going to get in the way. Put it over here. Uh, next step is extend each of the force vectors with a dotted line as far as it goes on the page in both directions. So I'm not going to do as far as it goes, but I'm going to do far enough. This will get cluttered, but you'll see why this is relevant in a minute. OK, um, so we've done that. Now we have to choose a pivot point. Now, here's where you make a bad choice. Um, I'm going to choose what might be seen as the obvious pivot point. I'm going to choose our pivot point here. Maybe that's an obvious pivot point, but that's the choice I'm going to make. Next step, we're going to use geometry to determine the perpendicular distances um, from every force line to the pivot point. So I will. So our perpendicular of the force F, well, that's just 0. Uh, our perpendicular of the force N, that's also 0, because it's at the pivot. Um, come on, stop. Our perpendicular of the force, uh, let's say, H, well, so that is the distance from the pivot point to the extended force line. So that's this distance here. So we can use some trigonometry here. So that so it is the, uh, the sine of 60 degrees. Oh, I actually didn't give you the length of the ladder. Uh, the length of the ladder is L. There we go. So, the, uh, so that distance can be seen as, it's the same as this, dis as, sorry, uh, as this distance here. So it's just L times sine of 60 degrees. Um, let's do this for the weight. Oh, come on. Our perpendicular of the weight of the guy. That is going to be, well, so that is the distance between this line and the pivot point. So that's that distance. So that is. 3L over 4, he's 3 quarters of the way up, um, times the cosine of 60 degrees. By the way, what's the sine of 60 degrees? It's square root 3 over 2. So I'm just going to substitute that, that in here. Cosine of 60 degrees is a half. So I'm going to substitute that in here too. Um, our perpendicular of the weight of the ladder is um, L over 2 times uh, cosine of 60 degrees. So it's just L over 4 because cosine of 60 degrees is a half. All right. Sorry, my notes keep falling. Um, OK, so that's step five. We've determined that we used geometry to, to determine the distance. These are the moment arms. Now we're going to multiply the moment arm by the magnitude of the force to obtain the magnitude of the torque. So now I'm going to do this for each one. So the torque uh, for the force, or for the friction force, 
I'm actually going to do step um, six and seven together. I'm going to find determine the magnitude and the direction. So the torque for the friction force is zero because it's just the moment arm has length zero. So it doesn't matter what the ma magnitude of the force is. Come on, stop. I'm going to kill. Mm. Stop. All right. This is getting ridiculous. OK. So the torque due to the uh, due to the normal force is also 0 because it has moment arm length 0. The torque, not the torque, the torque, mm, the torque due to the horizontal contact force, well, that is, that's um, three, square root of 3 over 2 times L times the magnitude h. And from uh, just from our intuition, we know that if you fix the pivot point and you pushed on in the direction of h, the object would go clockwise. So that's positive. So that's square root 3 over 2 lh. The torque for the weight of the dude is, well, the weight of the dude is 700 newtons. I'll just call it w sub l for now. And that would cause a counterclockwise motion. So this is minus 3 l w sub g over 8. And the weight of the ladder is also counterclockwise. So this is minus L W sub L over 4. OK, so we did 6 and 7 together. That, these are the values of the torques. So now we just add them all up and see what happens. So the net force in the x direction is 0 because it's in static equilibrium. And so we get that the, well, let's add up the forces. We have, it's like my hand, it's like it's, the, the hand detection is failing. We have h minus f. Those are the only horizontal forces. The force, the net force in the y direction is also zero because it's in static equilibrium. And so we have n minus wg minus wl. And we have the torque, the net torque is zero, which is, we just add up all of the torques, which is square root. 3 over 2 LH minus 3 LWG over 8 minus LWL over 4. OK, so now we have three equations. What do we need to solve for? Well, we know what the, the two weights are. And we know that L is the length. So, the, so those are the only knowns in this, quant in, this fact, in this calculation. We don't know F. We don't know H. We don't know N. And we don't know, um, oh, that's it. So, so now you can go and you can calculate, um, solve the system. And after doing enough work, um, you would find using, the, uh, <clears throat> using, the using this equation, you could find that h, so from here we find that h is 346 newtons. It takes a little bit of algebra to do. It's kind of annoying. but you get that it's 346 newtons. And then from the fx equation, we get that h, we have h minus f equals 0. And so that implies that the friction force is 346 newtons. So, so you actually did have to solve for all of these. We did not need to actually use this at all. Um, you did, we didn't need to use fy at all. It didn't play a role. Um, but I mean, it is what it is. Like That's, that's just what happened. Now, the reason I say this is bad is because you had to use all three of these equations, or at least two of the three equations, and one of them was kind of messy. And you know, there's all of this trig to do. Let's instead use a good pivot choice. So I'm going to repeat everything's the same. So I'm going to copy this over. And you're going to say, well, where did that come from? But it'll work out, I promise. So a good pivot choice. And by good, I mean efficient. Not there. I'm going to put it in this seemingly random spot up here. So now, well, what do we find? Well, first of all, neither, neither h nor n are going to contribute to, so, so we, can, we can do this again. Um, I think that we should, should probably have plenty of time to finish this so I can show you. Uh, what it's like to choose a good pivot point. It's life changing. Hmm. So 
the friction force has a um, has a what's it called a moment arm that's that's that long. So what is that? That is again the uh, the sine of sixty degrees. So it's root three l over two. The normal force has a moment arm of zero still, and the reason for that is because the extended force line passes through the pivot point. The horizontal force has a pivot or has a uh, a moment arm of zero as well. And then the weights, well, they actually are, take a little bit of work to do. Um, so we want to find, uh, oh, no, actually, no, they don't. It's this distance here. That's um, 3L over 4 times the, what, uh, times the cosine of 60 degrees. So our perpendicular W sub guy is, again, it's 3L over 8. And then, so that, that didn't change. And actually, uh, that one doesn't change either, because the horizontal distance is the same. So I think that was L over 4. All right, so now we're going to go through, and we can compute the torques. But um, And by the way, let's look at what terms are going to contribute to the torques. So both neither the normal force nor the horizontal force will contribute to the torque because they have zero moment they have zero moment arm so the only things that contribute to the torque to the net torque are the the weights that we know and the frictional force that we don't know so what we can actually do is we can completely ignore figuring out what the other forces are so let, let's just go through and compute the net torque so the net torque i'm going to kind of speed us along because we only have 4 minutes so the torque from the, um, from the friction force, that will cause a clockwise rotation. So it'll be plus, it'll be plus square root three L over two times F. The force from the, uh, from the two weights will be counterclockwise, so minus. So we have minus three L over eight times the weight of the guy minus um, L over four times the weight of the ladder. And so that's, at the end of the day, we're going to set that equal to zero. And you'll note that this is one equation, one variable that we can solve for. So we don't actually need to find out what h is at all. We, didn't need, we don't need the other equations to solve for that. So at this point, we can just say, oh, uh, well, I guess, I guess we just solve this equation. We don't worry about the forces. And you just compute, and you get that f is equal to 346 newtons, just as before. Um, so, so the reason this was a good pivot point is because it drastically cut down by the, uh, or at least somewhat cut down by the amount of calculations we had to do. We didn't have to worry about other force, about other force calculations. And by just considering a good pivot point, all of the information that we needed was captured in just the net torque equation. We didn't have to worry about uh, there being multiple variables to solve for because the other variables in our problem didn't actually show up in our calculation for the torque they would be determined by the net force, just as, uh, just as they were before, which, yeah, they're, they're determined there. Net force in the x and y direction. Um, right. So that's, th that's a, those are examples of a good and a bad pivot, uh, pivot choice. They both will get you the same answer. Like, the bad pivot choice is not, like, wrong to choose. It's just, it'll just make your life a little bit harder. Um, so an example type problem that I might ask um, I didn't, but you know, I could ask this on a final, for example, would be something like, if mu sub s is 0 0.4, how high can the guy climb uh, before the ladder slips? So the, the uh, keywords in this question, so we're considering the whole thing is pivoting about this point here. So the force would be clockwise. The, so, so imagine that you're pushing on something down here that's going to cause rotation this way. Whereas for the, for the weights, you're pushing on something down this way, and that will cause the rotation to be counterclockwise. Um, so let, uh, so, so the, the point I was making is, you might say that uh, 
if the ladder slips, it's no longer in static equilibrium. The reason for that is because that means that the net force and the net torques aren't zero. So what? So this question basically amounts to relating the maximum frictional force to the normal force, which you could calculate. In fact, we could have calculated it here. Um, and then you could go and you could relate the uh, the position along the ladder as uh, like as a variable and use and solve for that. So there you would have something like f equals 0.4 n. And so you have one less variable in the form of the friction, but you have one more variable in the form of where the person is located. And so you could go home and you could solve that. And I would highly recommend it as good practice. All right. Um, so that is precisely where I wanted to get to today. So